disturbing echo of 1941. Now he is making explicit reference to Pearl Harbor. Uh, what he was referring to the history when U.S. placed economic embargo on the Empire of Japan, and and that uh, some historians argue forced Japan into the war to bomb Pearl Harbor. What 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 Albridge is of course saying is we got to increase our defense spendings. You know, a lot of these Pentagon. Um, military industrial complex grifters are now using inflating China threat to justify more and more U.S. defense funds uh, spending, which is almost a trillion dollars at the moment. Um, and so, so here we are. We are starting a economic war against China for something that they may possibly do in the future. But really, it's just about to making these people rich. And it's very dangerous. It's very irresponsible because China and U.S. are both nuclear powers. Uh, any misstep that could lead to World War III. And, and right now, people like Eric Schmidt is basically saying, oh, yeah, we got we to gotta go down this path because we have to make sure China do not develop the Skynet before we do. I mean, it's a, it's a stupid premise. And it's a very dangerous implementation. And this concludes my uh, brief uh, 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 talk. And, and I guess we can open the floor for questioning. Thank you very much, Carl. That was a very concise and thorough piece. Um, I think that'll stimulate some good discussion. Um, well, I, you know, Bruce got in early. So, Bruce, I'm going to just call on you to, to jump off and start the, uh, the flow of the discussion. Thank you, Carl. The This provocation... That's what I'm really hearing and seeing from what you presented. Uh, what the U.S. did with the chi with the Chips Act seems, as especially as described in that New York Times article, is just such a blatant provocation, as you rightly compare it to the embargo against Jap Japan leading up to forty one. I'm reminded of a recent report of some mega wealthy person or or two or three who are building huge and expensive underground bunkers i forget who it was i remember it was in new zealand was this was the story plus what i've heard about our fin the west's financial bubble for lack of a simpler world where it is so precarious that these lunatics are really driving for some kind of a war like this to just pull the rug out from under so much to reset the economy, reset the, the debts, and for every other unbelievable, insane reason. I guess I want you to, you know, what do you make of those observations in terms of, of how hell-bent for such a conflict should we as assume these lunatics who are in charge, at least here in America, the likelihood of all of these type of things? Um, you know, I like I used to joke that we live in the um, we live in the accelerated timeline for um, for fallout <laughs> if, for people who, are, who do not know fallout is this uh, RPG game that um, that talk about uh, a nuclear a post nuclear apocalyptic world. The premise was a nuclear war started between US and China in the 2070s, 75, I think. And and, and, and I, I joke like now we're on an accelerated timeline uh, um, because I think fundamentally these uh, nut jobs, I think they think they can get away with it because they actually don't think it, it will lead to a nuclear war um, because there is their own belief in the American exceptionalism. They, they don't think China would respond. Uh, because so far, China has been incredibly patient. I mean, uh, the Chinese leadership must have like the, the discipline of <laughs> of Zen masters. If it's up to me, you know, the war would have been started a long time ago. But um, I, I think China has been the responsible adult right now uh, by holding back because uh, the whole U.S. strategy currently is to for to continue provocation to force China to fire the first shot. I was watching a, a war game which conducted by one of these think tanks last year 
Um, their whole premise is again a replay of Pacific War, except you know now with China bombing the um, bombing the U.S. base in on Guam to start the war. Uh, but I, but what if China don't pull the trigger? You know, this is what China is not right, right now. China is trying to break through the American economic blockade through its own indigenous innovations. Um, which I, I actually believe have a high degree of success. And, and you know, the, China is not going to go to war just because U.S. has this economic blockade. But the U.S. arrogance can be seen by the recent um, Janet Yellen visit to China. So basically, Janet Yellen went to China supposedly to stabilize the ties. But what Janet Yellen told the chi Chinese is that uh, you guys are not supposed to um, place restrictions on those uh the rare earth element gallium and germanium that's used to make advanced semiconductors that's that's a that's the violation of free market spirit but we we have a right to restrict uh, the chips export to you because we have valid national security concerns so basically uh you, you guys get to do you guys don't get to do what we do because you know we make the rules and and i think this that that level of arrogance leading all these nut jobs going down this very dangerous path. Um, you know, you, China has been incredibly patient, incredibly rational. You know, uh, some other country may not access, uh, some some other country may not act the same way as China does. You know, like we see when, when U.S. has pressed on Russia, on its uh, expanding NATO, encroaching on Russia's um, boundaries, and, you know, that sparks the Ukraine war. That, uh, but 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 China is trying to avoid a war on on Taiwan Strait. So that's the the, the the rational Chinese government is actually our best hope right now for averting World War Three. Um, I'm sure the U.S. Uh, um, planner will keep on pushing. But uh, there there's some difference of views. I just listened to a Mearsheimer talk recently. So Mearsheimer is one of those realist thinkers. And he has a very good understanding of how U.S. works. And he said he believes the administration in, in Washington actually do not want a war. The crazy ones are in Congress. You know, as long as the, the Congress is just making noises, um, as long as the, the, the people in, in, Wash, in, in White House do not make the decision to spark a war, we would be OK. Because right now, the only thing that will make China act um militarily is if taiwan start to unilaterally declare independence that china has said that's a red line and as long as washington do not push the taiwan government to do so because we know taiwan government would never take such momentous decision without explicit approval go ahead and encouragement from washington so as long as that doesn't happen um i think we um, the the prospect for war is small. Um, yeah, and I want to. I just I just want to add to that. Uh, the what seems obvious to me is the United States, in partnership with our media, as evidenced by this thing in the Times, want to portray us at the brink of being attacked every year of our lives ad infinitum in perpetuity to justify year after year after year our enormous and unnecessary military expenditures so you're right short of actually pulling the trigger on something it's going to be saying this doing this restricting this embargoing this sending a fleet here withdrawing it just so year after year after year after year we can plausibly be shown by our government and the media we got to be ready for a war with them. We got to be ready for a war with them. We got to be ready for a war with them. We got to be ready for a war with them. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you, Bruce. That was a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Doyle, are you still there? I, I am. Uh, thank you, Carl. Really enjoyed the lecture. If I can go back to kind of uh, earlier in time, part of your lecture and the uh, Chinese Civil War, uh, my question kind of focuses on the uh, the British uh, opium war type uh, scenario. To what extent did the Chinese civil war and the communist victory upset 
imperial opium plans and perhaps forced the Vietnamese war as the mechanism or the excuse to go in and have access to the Golden Triangle. Is there any relationship there in your mind? Um, there's uh, some tangential uh, uh, relation. So for um, when when the when the the opium war was started, as uh, people are, you know, as is well known, that it, because British want to sell opium into China, uh, China has placed a ban on the sale of opium, uh, forced the British merchant give up their opium stocks. That was a uh, that was a reason for the British to start not only one but two opium wars, and as a result of the opium wars. Uh, something happened because after um, the Anglo-French forces captured Beijing and burned down the South Summer Palace and forced China to legalize opium trade, uh, the Chinese officials decided to liberal to open up opium trade for all. So not just allowing importation, but also allow cultivation of opium in China. So by the late 19th century and early 20th century, China actually became one of the world's main uh and production base of opium, and and to the point where um, the o, o, the opium is mostly grown in the province where I, I I was born, Sichuan province in inland China, and they will harvest opium, load it on the ships, and sail down to the Yangtze rivers. And of course, British control the shipping on the Yangtze River uh, back then, and also the, the the U.S. Navy had a Yangtze patrol on the Yangtze River for hundred years, from from eighteen fifties to nineteen. 49 and and all these foreign ships were sailing up and down the Yangtze and so the opiums would be shipped down the Yangtze River from Sichuan province through the Three Gorge down to Shanghai where it will be processed in the Shanghai factories into heroin and those heroin then exported from China to places like west coast of United States um, during the World War II ironically because the Japanese, they then control the opium and heroin trade. So the addicts in North America was actually got cut off from, from the from, from opium and heroin. And they had a couple of years to go cold turkey. But that was uh that ended with the Japanese surrender, the, the, the opium heroin trade continued. And when the Chinese communists came to power, they put a blanket ban. On opium production, they eradicated opium production, and that created a whole, uh, basically a whole vacuum on the supply side. And and this is when the remnant nationalist army, the KMT army, uh, a portion of them escaped through the southwestern part of China into northern Myanmar. That's a Golden Triangle area, and there, with the help of CIA, they set up a new base. Um, they turned Golden Triangle back then was the world's largest production base for opium um, and source of heroin. And and that that and in 1950s, the, the back then the, the US drug star SAR claimed it was Mao, you know, to 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 cover up for the CIA operation, it, he claimed Mao was flooding the world with opium when exactly opposite was happening. Um it was because Mao cut off this opium. Production now. Now they CIA was able to uh, create this uh, alternative source in the Golden Triangle, and the opium finance a lot of the European colonial governments. You know, the, for for example, the French colonial government in Indochina, their their government revenue is heavily dependent on the opium tax, um, and and so is uh, British Burma, et cetera, et cetera. Like a lot of these. Uh, Colonial government wouldn't be profitable if they, you know, if they it wasn't run on the back of the opium trade, and and uh, so <laughs> um, uh, the the funny anecdotal stories about the Dian Bian Fu was that th that area around Dian Bian Fu was also one of the few major opium growing regions in northwestern Vietnam, and the. The warlord that the the Dai warlord that controlled that area, um, you know, used to it was a French puppet, and and but he was squeezing the locals so hard by making them, you know, harvesting opium and paying him taxes that the locals revolted and gone over to Viet Minh, and and this is why the Viet Minh were able to sneak up on the French. Without French being aware, they 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 lock our the French set up in Dian Bien Phu in this valley, 
the idea is they will be invincible, but uh, because you know you cannot you cannot be hit by artillery directly. But these locals who are tired of these being squeezed by the local opium lords, they help the Vietnamese to lug the artillery all the way up the through the jungle up the mountains, and from the top of the mountains, point directly into the Dien Bien Phu, and that turned Dien Bien Phu into a death trap for the French. And and so hopefully I answer your question. No, no, you did. Thanks. I just, uh, for some reason, the the whole Afghanistan and Taliban thing with shutting down the opium and the the heroin kind of rang my bell when you were discussing things of of the Asian side. And I was just wondering if there were uh, inherent similarities, and it seems there are. It's, Thank you. It's uh, it's it's amazing wherever CIA turns up and the, the, the opium trade follows because the drug trade is a perfect way for the CIA to uh, uh, and intelligence. Uh, services of uh, uh, other European countries as well to keep the money off the books and and you know they one of the way the opium uh, got out from Golden Triangle was through the CIA airline as uh, I think it's called Civil Air Transport which is run by uh, uh, Claire Chanel so Claire Chanel was actually a hero during World War II because he was a leader of the Flying Tigers and and so he had a very close tie to the nationalist government in China. And during the Chinese Civil War, he made a killing by helping Jiang Kai She to ship tro- uh, to airlift troops and supplies to the nationalist troops tro- trapped behind communist lines. And but after the Civil War wound down, you know Chanel's business dried up. So that's where CIA came in with the money to help him, to buy his airline. And uh, oh. they, they ran the cat, the uh, civil air um, air transport out of Taiwan and. They they structured it so the KMT supposedly has a sixty percent stake, and the reason CIA structured that way so you can, they can present it as a, a Taiwan airline uh, rather than American airline, so the CIA don't have to answer to the to the bureaucrats in Washington who will look into their books, and mm-hmm. and the, the 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 CAT would fly opium from Golden Triangle, fly out and fly in weapons from Taiwan. So and and this was also done through um, the predecessor of USAID, who financed a project, a road project in northern Thailand, it was supposedly for rural development in rural Thailand, but really was to be able for the opium to get out from Myanmar into Thailand through these roads. Um, I highly recommend Alfred McCoy's book, uh, The Politics of Heroin. It's, it, it has very detailed description of these uh, very nefarious uh, intelligence uh, agency activities in the Golden Triangle and the drug trade. Hmm. Super. Thanks, Carl. On that note, sure. um, there's an observation and a question I have for you, Carl. Um, there's a, a lot of propaganda right now uh, circulating amongst the Western, um, I guess, conservative consumer class, uh, especially spread by by things like the John Birch Society, that China is getting its reverse. There's a reverse opium war underway and China is getting its revenge by producing all of these like fentanyl precursors and, and flooding it into the West to destroy our spirit. And one, so the first observation I have is John Birch. I, I did a little Google search to see just who the hell is John Birch in the first place? And he was actually, uh, he was an employee. He worked for uh, Claire Chenault and the Flying Tigers. Um, so he was directly implicated in the CIA operation that you were talking about that created the whole drug culture to begin with. Um, but the second question is... Could, John Birch like was part you. of OSS, the predecessor yeah. to the CIA. You know, he was like... Yeah. <laughs> well, I think he was still with the CIA when OSS became the CIA. So you yes. know, that's why he was being valorized as you know one of those men who gave their life for the agency in China. Yeah. <laughs> and the other the other uh, question that follows up then is... Um, how would you, I'd like to hear your your uh, remarks to those who would say, "Oh, uh, China is producing these these precursors and are are flooding us." Uh, what's your response to that? Okay, so first of all, the the so called the fentanyl precursors, they are the chemicals used to produce normal pharmaceutical drugs, and those are being produced by pharmaceutical factories in China because you know, as you know, all the factory has been offsourced to China right now. I mean, in, including pharmaceuticals, and what happened is these uh, these uh, transnational gangs uh, based in Mexico that they would import these chemical cursors 
into Mexico, where in the in the underground factory, they will use these chemical cursors, uh, precursors to um, make fentanyl. So, so the 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 question is, okay, why is China doing this? Well, China is doing chi Chinese pharmaceutical companies are producing legit uh, pharmaceutical chemicals that's used to make pharmaceuticals. And but there have been those farmers just so happen those precursors can also be used to make fentanyl and and they're being imported by gang yes they're being imported by gangs into uh into Mexico to make fentanyl and to to flood North America because right now North America is in a large opiate corp or crisis I mean U S has always been like U S has always been in one form or another of drug crisis. I mean, this this stretch back in the days, you know, do, even during the Vietnam War, the, the, the heroin was brought home. Uh, the One of the heroin problem was brought home when the US GIs returned from Vietnam War. You know, they got hooked by on cheap heroin while they're stationed uh, doing the R&R &R in Thailand, for example, when all those heroin were flooding in from Golden Triangle, you know, produced by the CIA back KMT faction. And and when they came back to U.S., they brought back their heroin habits. And and U.S. just moved on from one drug to another because I think we have serious social problems in this country, and people face it. People need to face face it. There's a there's a serious problem of social decay, and and the drug problem is just one manifestation of that. And you know we we also know CIA has been been involved in shipping cocaine, you know, into the country, uh, you know, that that that's well documented uh, from Central America. So the, the, the fentanyl issue is really a, a law, U.S. law enforcement problem and also a U.S. societal problem mm -hmm. um, because there's a large demand that was created that created this insane amount of profit that those gangs in Mexico would do, um, would, would, manufacture and produce them now chinese government actually was in cooperation with the u.s law enforcement agency to track the shipment of these uh, fentanyl um chemical precursors that's what's been shipped from the chinese factories um because of the because of the u.s waged sanctions on china china has stopped the cooperation uh, about two years ago so, 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 you know, because now U.S. is crying wolf about secret Chinese police stations on North America, you know, in Canada. So Chinese law enforcement, you know, fuck it. We're not going to work with you anymore. And, and, and so, so, so this is way now, now this problem has been worse. And, and this problem has been worsened because of the U.S. Uh, waged uh, uh, economic war on China. Thank can you. I, can I interject real quick to this yes. point? Yeah. Sure. For the last three years i've been doing marketing for trine day publishing and chris milligan is the founder of trine day and i highly recommend folks interested in the the drugging of america and the cia's role in it to go to trineday.com and find the tab for the podcasts there's about 125 100, uh, 130 episodes we've put up they're about a half hour long and if you scroll down just just click on the first titles that might say something about cia or cia drugs there's plenty of them and here's chris's point when chris was 20 years old in 1969 his father sat him down and said um that chris's father left the cia in 1959 and he was in, he had a big position in the far east and the first thing, and he could he did he couldn't talk about it for ten years. So in 1969, he finally had a conversation with young Chris. And the first thing he said is the Vietnam War is all about drugs. There's these secret societies behind it all. They're out to opiate your entire generation. Chris didn't know what to make of that. And his father went on to say, and communism's all a sham. These same secret societies are behind it all. It's all a big game to them. And in conclusion, I'll share what, what Chris teaches in many of these podcasts. These are his podcasts over at Trine Day. He's interviewing his different authors, and I'm like the Ed McMahon. I welcome people to the top of it. I kibitz a little, I edit, and I put it up on the on the internet. And um, 
Chris makes this this really interesting uh, assertion from his 50 years of studying the secret societies, primarily Skull and Bones, but all the people in the shadows, as he calls it, and even how they're spread out around the you know the world and how they function in Europe and even in China. He says that what the folks in the shadows at the secret societal level, it doesn't mean the whole CIA, it doesn't mean many elements of the CIA. He describes the folks at that secret societal level reach down through these different influ- in institutions to the people that they can influence, blackmail, bribery, etc. What they did in the 1960s was repeat what the same type of folks did in the 1860s. They wanted to destroy a generation of Americans with the traumatic assassination of our father figure, king figure, president, Abraham Lincoln, John F. Kennedy, a war that would addict the wounded to drugs. And very specifically in in Vietnam, unlike any other war, you weren't recruited for the duration you went in for one year and then you went home. And in that year, the plan was to addict as many soldiers as possible in order to, as we've seen for the last 55, 60 years, as Carl, you were just describing, the societal erosion and destruction in huge part because of of drugs. So what a world, what a world. Yeah, I, I'll just just adding to that. Uh, the the uh, now it reminded me that the the drugs actually play a huge part in the Vietnam War because um, the the French intel French were were was losing the war in in Vietnam, uh, both north and south. They're trying to retain their hold on the South Vietnam against the communist resistance, and what they finally realized is that you know they don't they lack the intelligence on the ground so f- the french decide to to co-opt the local gangs local secret societies and and gangsters this uh, specifically these pirates of uh make uh, river pirates of mekong river and the, f- the french colonial government actually turn over blocks of saigon and cholong these tw- blocks by blocks they turn over the controls to these uh, river pirates, uh, because these river pirates, they know the local society well. They they are the eyes on the ground. They are much more effective at rooting out the communist cells. So so the French authority basically turned over running of Saigon to the the, the pirates of Mekong, and and they had a free reign until mid fifties. Uh, but but at that time. There was a turf war between the French intelligence and the CIA because Americans are trying to muscle their way in. And because these uh, Vietnamese gangsters were in the pay of the French, so the CIA decided to do a number on them. <laughs> and then in the end, the, 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 the river pirates of Mekong were decimated. And, and that is when they the colonial authority even lost their eyes on the ground you know they, they no longer know what, what is going on but before that those uh those uh uh, uh french uh, uh, vietnamese gangsters they control every all the they can all the aspect of economy in saigon they had they run all the brothels all the gambling halls all the opium dens and and they are effectively effectively policing the whole city um, but when when you when CIA came in and destroyed that whole structure because CIA wants to put their own men in, that destroyed the the French counterintelligence operation, and that actually led the um the the war in South Vietnam to um, you know they they lost control after that. You know they they no longer have their eyes on the ground. <laughs> the communists c- was infiltrating everywhere without without them even even knowing. Just uh. You know, I, again, I recommend the Alfred uh, McCoy's book, uh, Politics with Heroin, a great, 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 great book. Since since we're building people's libraries to this subject, I would recommend uh, JFK. I think it's Vietnam CIA plot to kill President Kennedy by Vietnam, uh, the CIA and the plot to kill Kennedy, I believe. By, by Crowdy, uh, Fletcher. Crowdy. Yeah. yeah. And he describes how the CIA forced 
transported, helped, seduced, lied, and then betrayed with no uh, resources, a million, more than a million Vietnamese from the north to come down to the south. And they became these starving, unwelcome strangers who were the marauders, who were then demonized as the Viet Cong. They were just trying to, to live. And it's just an, it's just one tactic that was used to destabilize and make that, oh, a place we had to pour in military in order to, to control and do all the horrible things we wanted to do there, like smuggling drugs back into this country, not only in the body bags of our dead soldiers, but by credible reports in the bodies of some dead American soldiers throughout the 1960s and into the early 70s. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the incense we have to burn and the prayer we have to do to cleanse the karma of what the United States did to Vietnam and the Native Americans. And, you know, this list goes on to the current day is um, at profound. And that just reminded me, there was actually another clear Chanel connection to Vietnam uh, during the the election. Um, uh, I think it's uh, the, the election that elected, finally elected uh, Richard Nixon. At the time, there was a peace negotiation between North and South Vietnam. But Nixon sent his special envoy to the South Vietnamese government to tell them to hold off, to call off the, the peace negotiation because they want the peace to come after Nixon has been elected the president so he can take credit. And, yeah. and they don't want to give an October surprise to the Democrats. And the envoy that Nixon chose is none other than Anna Chanel, uh, Claire Chanel's Chinese wife. And, uh, and because Anna Chanel has a lot of contact in the South Vietnamese government. So she went down there, told them, cancel the peace talk. Um, so the war would drag on for a few more years. And, would, you know, yeah. but more Americans died, of course. Yeah, Nixon yeah. was was conveying, you'll get, I'll give you a better deal if I become president. And half the American casualties and presumably half the Vietnamese casualties of the war followed that. So thank you, Richard Nixon, for nothing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Monty's been waiting for a bit. Monty, are you still... Yeah, there you are. Yeah, thank you, Carl, uh, very much. I, I do have a question, but uh, I, I'd like to make a comment uh, before my question, if I could. I, I happen to have, this is close to my heart, because I was actually uh, in Southeast Asia, 1968, 1969. And uh, uh, I would just like to say that drug running, arms trafficking, and... Uh, human trafficking are inexorably intertwined. I mean, they're a part of everything. Uh, during my time in Vietnam, I mean, I can testify so far as the drug running and uh, uh, what happened with the addictions thereafter and while we were there was uh, very evident. Uh, and it wasn't just in Taiwan that the United States uh, promoted uh, prostitution and sex trafficking in uh, in Vietnam itself, in the Philippines, and in uh, Thailand, uh, these were very much evident and facilita facilitated by the U.S. government. Uh, as far as arms trafficking, uh, that goes along with it. I mean, as evidenced right now, uh, where I'm down in Mexico, you're seeing AT-4 anti-tank weapons uh, showing up with the cartels and that's being used as leverage to put pressure on Mexico that the United States might intervene in Mexico and get their hands in that. But uh, to my question, and it uh, somewhat intersects with what uh, Matthew was referring to and so far as uh, uh, the new PSYOPs coming about, which he alluded to the John Birch Society. Uh, uh, the question is, there's a whole new movement out there that I interacted with last week and did somewhat of a deep dive, whereas uh, uh, networks affiliated with, they use the Rockefeller Foundation and a new prospect for America. Uh, and basically what they're alluding to is that the world economic, since they're losing in Ukraine, uh, their main goal there was the destruction of Russia. It seems they have to change the narrative now and that the latest narrative is that the whole world is meant to be 50 shades of China. 
This is coming from our Rockefeller report on the prospect for a new America. And behind this uh, are Falun Gang affiliated organizations, anarchists and libertarians, uh, the Liberty Beacon, the Republican Broadcast Network, the Epic Times. And the basic uh, narrative is that, uh, in point of fact, the multipolar world, uh, the BRICS, the SCO, and so forth, is really a grand conspiracy by the Illuminati to defeat the unipolar world uh, because China is really behind this grand scheme with the Illuminati to destroy the West and take it over. And uh, it's rather sophisticated argument they're presenting. Uh, it's coming from the highest lit networks, and I'm seeing it profoundly across different uh, websites right now. This seems to be uh, the latest grip. They're trying to change the narrative to do this. Uh, are you familiar with any of that, and could you comment on that? Um, okay, so I like to say when U.S. talk about China, it's almost 100% projection. You know, all, all this talk about um, the global uh, cabal controlling, it's not a conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy that wealthy controls everything in the United States. You know, U.S. is a plutocracy. We have billionaires like Jeff Bezos only, only Washington Post. You know, I just, in my presentation, I just showed that Eric Schmidt, who, who has, uh, whose net worth is about $25 billion, is is the main driving force behind this chip war against China. Like the billionaire sets our agenda. This is not a conspiracy. Uh, we don't need a conspiracy for that. And, and But somehow the multipolar world is another, <laughs> like a billionaire conspiracy to overthrow uh, America. I mean, that that's just like a little <clears throat> mental gymnastic and, and projection. And, and and what the multipolar polar war is really saying, they're they're not sort of saying <clears throat> now now the 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 BRICS is gonna go take over the world. What what they're saying is we don't want U.S. to come in and tell us what to do. <laughs> we just want each individual country to have their own sovereignty to uh to to determine their own path of development. You know, you don't need U.S. government to shove. Uh, whatever agenda, you know, down our throat, whether it's social, political, uh, economic models, you know, the, each country should be free to determine their own development and path, which I think it's, <laughs> it's common sense. It, I mean, like that, I, I also have to remind people that, that currently the BRICS, the, the, the GDP grouping of the BRICS just surpassed the G7 this year. Uh, the BRICS right now, composed of uh, 31 point per, uh, 31 percent of the world GDP whereas the G7 only composed of 30 percent so yeah. you know like the BRICS they don't need to overturn anything they are already bigger than um than the G7 and and they're what they're saying is why we are still using U.S. dollar as a reserve currency so you U.S. government can use this as a weapon to sanction everyone Right. The, the, the real the real bite of U.S. sanction is, you know, it's a global sanction because when U.S. plays an economic sanction on you, anybody who use U.S. dollars who have any kind of U.S. dollar transaction is how is being binded by this by the sanction. So so this is a logic why, especially after Russia got sanctioned uh, for the push of de-dollarization. That's why the BRICS are trying to push for their um, the BRICS reserve currency to replace the U.S. dollar as a world reserve currency, which, which would make sense. You, you will make these uh, countries um, immune from, from U.S. economic sanctions. And mm -hmm. and and yeah, I, I, I mean, it's uh, it's some, sometimes it's sad. You know, I look at U.S., you know, it's, it's uh, right now it's very dysfunctional. And um, and, uh, you know, we don't need to project our own dysfunctions into other other parts of the world. It's 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 pretty plain to see for everyone. Uh, we are being run by a bunch of oligarchs, a bunch of billionaires, and 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 if anything, you know, the BRICS is a response to that. Uh, I think somebody has a question. Uh, did I answer your question? Uh, uh, by the way, Monty. Uh, yes, it 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 did. Uh, 
uh, a part of this, which I omitted, uh, they have an elaborate set of maps on the so-called tri-state cities in the Netherlands, uh, which they say, you know, their basic support is the BRI is going there. So that's proof they're in collaboration with the WEF. As I said, it's rather <laughs> elaborate presentation they put together, uh, very skill sophisticated, but very easy to punch holes in, especially with uh, math. Matthew and uh, Cynthia's presentation on uh, 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 the anti-China psyops. Uh, I, I found it very useful, and I, I got a couple converts, but uh, these people are hyster hysterical over this. And by the way, I would just elaborate one step further on your military-industrial intelligence complex. Uh, I, I would describe it as the media, uh, military-industrial media-academic complex. Which really uncovers, yes. which really encapsulates uh, the intelligence community, also. But uh, those three are tied together. Yeah, Thank you again. Yeah, so I, I agree. The Mickey Matt, right? Um, it's yeah. just getting yeah. And right also, now. I just, 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 yeah. just, just one last thing to comment about the Netherlands as kind of the hub of the BRI to overthrow the Western-led uh, dominant. Uh, order, world order. Uh, Netherlands is part of EU. Netherlands is part of the Atlantis organization. Netherlands, Netherlands just signed on with US to play sanction on China. You know, one, one of the very important a a part of the Chip uh, Act against China is that Netherlands has a company, only one in the world, ASML, that produces this EUV machines, which is uh, they use lasers to etch this very tiny uh, transistors on the silicon chips. And, 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 and you, China cannot make their own advanced semiconductor chips without those machines from Netherlands. But Netherlands just agreed with the United States to place sanction on, on China. So, so, so this is, uh, Netherlands is, is definitely part of, uh, you know, it's to, to, to claim that US, Netherlands is somehow not a US vassal state. I think it's a stretching it, uh, I think, yeah, go ahead. Uh, back to you, Matt. Well, I, now that you've brought up the, the, the chip question, um, that actually ties right into something Magdalena had uh, written uh, written out as a question, which is relevant to this. She she asks, I know that two of the biggest chip companies operate out of Taiwan. Are their loyalties towards China or the New York Stock Exchange and therefore the USA? Well, <clears throat> Any company, yeah, their, their mean, loyalty is to profit. Hold on, on Mag Magdalena, yeah, yeah, if you want to fill, I just want fill to that out a bit more. Base because when you were talking about this, I was just quickly Googling, okay, who are the biggest chip manufacturers in the world? And then they listed the 10, for 10 top countries. And two of them were Taiwanese. And the one of them was the Netherlands, based in the Netherlands, the one you mentioned. Uh, I think that was number seven, okay? Uh, number one was in Taiwan. And number eight was in Taiwan, and number seven is uh, in the Netherlands. And the other ones that did not mention in the article where they're based from, which makes me kind of, you know, sometimes you have to look at the missing information to get a picture, right? And so I was wondering. Now, obviously, they are all trading on the New York Stock Exchange. The Taiwanese companies well, are also <clears throat> trading on the New York Stock Exchange. So that's why yeah. my... My question is, where is the loyalty here? Well, the, 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 <laughs> so, so normally, under normal circumstances, each company will just be loyal to the profit. But we're not functioning under the perfect free market here. You know, they have to, they have to answer to pressure from the United States. So the, the, glo the global supply chain for the semiconductor production is actually very complex. Uh, the, the production is... The, the, the sets is spread out geographically. So you have the actual fabrication of the chips, the physical making of the chips. That's happening on Taiwan under TSMC. Netherlands plays a very important part because they're a very important company called ASML. They make the EUV machines, which uh, use, because right now the chips are getting smaller and smaller. You know, seven nanometers, you can't, your eye, naked eye can't even see it. What the the Netherlands uh, company ASM, uh, ASML does, they develop this very advanced machinery called EUV machine that use lasers to to etch on this tiny silicons, a little transistor to pack them together, and and there's the only company in the world that does it. And but the 
but the components used by the ASML machine, the lasers themselves, are produced by a German company. And and so so these are there are all these different companies tied together. But to United States advantage, most of these companies, I mean, most of in most of the countries are used at U.S. vassal right. states. I mean, Germany, Netherlands, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, none of them can say no to United States. So when you U.S. wanted this to happen, you know, Biden <laughs> sent his, his representative to these countries and 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 told them, hey, you gotta you know you gotta jump on board with this uh, our our bandwagon of anti-China crusade. And they say, okay, you know, you know when when U.S. says jump, these countries have to say how high. So you know, I I mean, like yes, their loyalty normally would be to profit because TSMC actually at one point. Uh, a huge portion of their uh, of their Body export rock. market is actually China. A huge portion of their export market is actually China. You know, I think that at one point, like forty percent of their export market was China. But that market has been cut off by United States government, and U.S. is saying we will compensate you with some tax incentive. We'll, 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 we'll uh, you know, and 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 U.S. is also forcing TSMC to uh, create open up plants in Arizona in United States. So they they don't have to rely on chips producing in Taiwan. So you know, like like right now, all these countries TSMC, if it's up to themselves, they would just continue to produce in Taiwan and make a lot of money by selling both to United States and China. But you know, we don't live in that world of free markets. So you know, so they have to they 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 have to answer to United States. Mm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that, this is an important uh, learning process for a lot of people who have been led to believe that it's simply the money that makes the world go around, but there's actually this higher domain of ideas um, and intentions that actually makes the world go around, and it, it's not so much money per se. Um, and and as we can see, it, you know, like a lot of people I noticed even criticize me and Cynthia a lot for for thinking, oh, you're defending. You're you're saying that the multipolar alliance is is a bunch of angels because they don't want to divide and conquer and play these imperial games, and so they're they're these angels. And anybody who thinks that that it's a legitimate, um, actual process is naive. But it's like no, like you just said, Carl, it's just good business. It's good rational common sense to have a world that's not on fire. And if you're developing your neighbors rather than exploiting them and keeping them poor and underdeveloped. Uh, they will be better consumers, better better business partners for you who will trust you rather than hate you and want to destroy you. It's just common sense. And people have just become so and, and also I, I like to also I like to point out, you know, back in the time days when US was promoting globalization, they're actually saying the interconnectiveness, um, the, the the widespread of global supply chain actually means we're less likely to have conflict because now, now we're all interconnected. So what United States right now is trying to do is to cut off all these linkages to make the conflict more likely. Um, I, I'd just, just like to point that out. So go ahead, yeah. uh, back yeah. to you, Matt. People need to chew on these ironies. It's good. Uh, well, I, I think we have time. How much time do you have left there, uh, Carl? I, I can go on whatever, man. I'm, yeah. It's still early for me. It's only 8.48. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, all right. Well, Jonathan. Oh, been... actually, I, I have a I have a dead stop at ten o'clock my time, but we still have like an hour and twenty minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, we won't take that much of your time, but I, uh, but we'll take yeah, some yeah, of that yeah. uh, for sure. Uh, okay. So we have Jonathan, then we have uh, a follow up from Stephen, then Jerry, then Bruce. So Jonathan, go for it. Yeah, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Carl. Um, my question is more along: um, Is China doing anything to have more? I wouldn't say state ownership, but ownership by industrialists based in China who have a more ideological view for the nation state. And the reason I'm asking that is, is China doing anything to prevent these large hedge funds, BlackRock, Vanguard, and so forth, from actually having a key stakeholder or shareholder position in, let me say, railroad elements or other national security um Area, sectors of the economy because um, as, as Monty was speaking earlier about these narratives, there is narratives like oh well, especially in the global south you hear, well BRICS is just an um, a Trojan horse for China to come and take over as hegemony 
or you'll hear um uh yeah that the same oligarchs in the West that we are against in the World Economic Forum or whatever, they are behind the SCO and BRICS because it's the same industrialists. But I mean, personally, I see the industrialists in the East, they have a more nationalist um, sovereignty ideology in how they carry about their business in those countries compared to the West. Or um, is that true? And if so, to what extent? So the two questions is, how are they detaching away from these big hedge funds having ownership in their countries, especially in China? And is there a more nationalist spirit within the industrialists in China that could help them shield such a case where these big hedge funds are just literally buying up anything they can get their hands on? Uh, that, that, that's a great question. First, uh, China has a very different system from the United States. In, in U.S., basically, you know, if you money talks, you have you have you have be a billionaire, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Um, that is not the case in China. China, Jack Ma, you know, one of the wealthiest men in China, uh, the, the, the founder of Alibaba, he does not get to sit policies. You know, Jack Ma does not get to own newspapers on mainland China. He can go to Hong Kong, where it's still maintaining the capitalist system. Jack Ma can go to Hong Kong, buy up South China Morning Post, which he did, but he cannot buy any newspapers on mainland China, right? And <clears throat> so Jack Ma cannot be best Jeff Bezos of China. And and as we can see, you know, the Chinese government was actually cracking down on Alibaba when it, Alibaba was trying to branch into the financial services because Chinese state views certain areas of uh, the economy as as a pillar of industry that they maintain control. Those are called so-called commanding heights of economy. Those, those are, for example, energy sectors, oil and gas. They're all state-owned. Right. They there's some uh, <clears throat> large private company that did get big, especially in tech like Alibaba. But they they the, the Chinese system is such that um, the, the Communist Party is still the big boss. They they're, they're not they tell Jack Ma what to do, not vice versa. And so that this is a very big difference. Um, you know, Eric Lee talk about this. Uh, Eric Lee, another investor, he, he talked about this. The difference between um, uh, China and United States is in U.S., the capital dictates to the state, you know, dictates state policy. In, in China, the state dictates to the capital. And, and, and you, 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 it's very obvious to see. So, so there's no possibility of, say, BlackRock coming in to buy up very important strategic uh, sector of the, the U.S. Uh, of Chinese economy. That that just not will not be allowed to happen. I mean, this is also a part of how China is exercising its own sovereignty. For example, when foreign companies come to China, there is a requirement usually attached for tech transfer. China says, OK, yes, you can access the Chinese market. You can access the vast pool of Chinese labor, but you have to do tech transfer. That means you have to train people, the local Chinese people, with your technology. Um, you have to like upgrade their skills. So what happened in the last 20, 40 years is that China continued to climb the tech tree. You know, some people in the West call this China stealing the technology. It's not stealing, it's very wide in the open. The Chinese government says you have to share technology if you want to do business in China. And and this is this is a this is an exercise in sovereignty because China and Russia are one of the few sovereign countries in the world, like uh, Lavrov says. And and about how you know they say BRI or BRICS is just a, a Chinese Trojan horse. Um, I, I I like to point out that Western sanction on Russia actually led to more Chinese goods in Russia. I, I was in Moscow two weeks ago, right? All the Western luxury brands have closed down. Prada, Chanel, you know, they all have a sign on the door said, due to technical reasons, <laughs> we are currently closed. And, and, and instead, if you go to like a new, uh, on the road, a lot of the older cars are Western brands, you know, for, for either Japanese or German. And, but if you go to new car dealerships, all the new cars coming in are Chinese-made cars. 
Now, this is a direct result of the Western sanction themselves, because the Western companies are 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 are, are prevented by sanction from participating in the Russian market. So, so, so the idea is that somehow BR, I mean. The West is doing a much better job of promoting Chinese products everywhere than China could ever hope to do by themselves, and and uh, you know a lot 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 of this is self owning. I I think people are trying to trying to come up with all kind of elaborate reason to justify uh, to 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 explain what's going on, but really it's not that complicated. You know, it, it, anything that can be explained away by stupidity and mediocrity, you don't need to resort to conspiracy theories. And, and right now, there's a lot of stupidity and and, and idiocy in in the Western uh, establishment elite. They are fucking up. Uh, I'm sorry, I swear they're, they're screwing up uh, uh, majorly right now. And this is what this is this is what actually enable the BRICS to arrive. But um, as for Chinese industrialists, I do believe they are more nationalistic than their Euro-American counterparts. For example, Huawei, which is the first tech, Chinese tech company that's been sanctioned by U.S. And many people don't know this, but Huawei is an employee-owned company. Huawei is a company owned by its own employees. So that's quite different from, say, Google right, <laughs> or, 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 or Apple. Um, and, and yeah, it's just uh, it's just it, 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 the cap the, the capitalists in China um they they're only allowed to do things within the certain parameter that state allowed them to do so i mean it, it's it's <clears throat> china china is a party state you know they the party is still very much in control and they the party is not beholden to the capitalists this is kind of a tradition of uh, if you look at the chinese history historically the chinese Confucian bureaucracy always maintain a tight control over its merchant class, and this kind of tradition, kind of you kind you kind of kind of see the carryover of tradition here. In China, the bureaucratic state dictated to the business, not the vice, not vice versa. I hope I answered your question, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, and just drawing back to a point you said earlier about um the West being kind of delusional. I remembered um Bloomberg ran an article when recently when China put the restrictions on gallium and germanium. And they were saying that China is scoring an own goal in the gallium market because China already suppresses the gallium market to keep the prices low. So now the, the prices will go higher and therefore other co Western companies would now come into the market and they can restore Western supply chain. And I was like, but you don't have that reserves of the physical um, relevant element. How you're even going to take this big participation in the supply chain? You know, it's like a huge disconnect, and and it's not like if and gallium itself is not taken from the earth alone. It's a byproduct when you extract coal and um, bauxite, I think. And yeah, so it's a huge disconnect. But they are convincing. I mean, I I live in the global south in the Caribbean. And, and I mean, we're within the U.S. sphere of influence, and they are still convincing a lot of the global south that you know China is not this growing industrial power, and they're just gonna use hegemony to try and further their own goals. But but hopefully, you know, reality somehow hits a lot of global south nations because that reality hasn't set in here yet. Yeah, I mean, I can we can see some of that already. You know, just look at the the Western sanction on Russia. Uh, if you look at the much of the global South is not signing up for that. Well, you know, all this uh, U.S. <clears throat> currently the proxy war against Russia and Ukraine. Most of the global South is like, why why should we side with you guys on uh, against Russia? We have nothing against Russia. And 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 when they talk about international community, it's always North America. The U.S. vassal states in Europe and a bunch of vast client state in East Asia. That's it. You know, Australia plus Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> and, and, and and right now, their their own relative importance in the global stage is increasingly shrinking as the you know the BRICS economy continue to grow. Um, and 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 it's uh, it's. It's quite amazing, actually. I saw a, a, poll, a recent poll of um, 
of a survey of optimism across all countries. And the, the I mean, all across the so-called <clears throat> developed nations in the West, the, the, the op, there was a total collapse in the optimism. You know, many people think they will be worse off five years from now rather than better. I mean, that's not the case in places like China or even Indonesia, where I am. You know, majority of people still think the life will be much better in five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's an irony, right? That an empirical piece of data we have is just do people support their their government and do they think life will be better in the future? Yes or no? And you find these these incredible, th this inverse set of statistics that is the very opposite of what we have in the transatlantic rules-based orderista West. And yet people are being fed the same thing we were told about Iraq and how, oh, yes, I know that Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi had 80 plus percent support of their people, but they're all brainwashed. You can't trust popular opinion there, but you can trust popular opinion here where our elections are fortified and legitimate and our people are wise. It's like the lack of humility and the, like you said, projection is just embarrassing. U U.S. still do one thing very well, which is uh, marketing and propaganda, which is basically the same, you know, because because U.S. is very good at marketing. Right. And and the, uh, the, there was a recent viral video of this uh, Russian soldier who was just went on a rant and, and and he was just basically saying, you know, for for 20 years, for 20, 30 years, our generation has been led to believe everything is great a paradise in the west and everything the shit in our own, on, on, in our own country you know whereas we actually have functioning roads you know our people actually go get educated go to college you know everybody you know uh, everybody every household have cars and and now on the battlefield they they, they, they hype up all these like their high-tech gadgets like the lipper tanks you know but that that only happens on the hollywood movies you know whereas we in russia we actually make weapons that works that that have durability and survivability i mean what he said was true it's uh, there's no lies detected right now um john, what jonathan also referring to is talking about all these uh copiums that's been produced by the western press and a lot of the western press is run by people who are not even experts these are propagandists they, they, they they're not even the subject experts they are just they're they're no longer journalists they're just uh regurgitating the line from the state department or the pentagon and, and to tell you who to hate uh who to fear and you know that's their job i mean they, they, they still have some influence but i think more and more you can fool all the people some of the time but you can't fool all the people all the time so uh, people people are waking up amen uh jerry you still there there you are hey. yes can you hear me indeed yes. oh good okay uh thank you very much carl for your presentation i was real excited when i heard you were going to be speaking this evening because i watched a lot of your videos ever since the one you did on the history of the british opium wars that was that was brilliant that's a classic so i had one question but i'm going to change it um because you were talking about alibaba and um you know china's uh anti-corruption campaign i guess jack ma's gone back to teaching somewhere but then i was reading where the new ceo after ma is gone is a guy named joseph say I don't know if I pronounced that right. And then I was reading about him and he says, oh, he has a passport in uh, Hong Kong and he also has a Canadian passport. I think his parents live here. So being from Canada, I'm wondering who the hell is this guy? Because you never hear about him. And I don't know if you know much about him, but I would love to pick your brain on who this Joseph Say is, if you could. Thanks um you actually know more than i do i haven't really followed the new uh the new top post at at the alibaba um but alibaba just got slapped down because they were getting into the chinese financial uh industry and they're trying to get into the chinese credit market um and they were also you know basically alibaba was 
through its online platform was basically issuing credit and uh, the, the Chinese government's like, no, 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 no. Like we, we are in control of the monetary policy here. You, you, you don't get to I I issue virtual online currency and, and you don't get to get into this financial sector in, in, a, in a back, uh, in, a, in a sneaky way, because we like to uh, regulate that. And, and, and this is just goes to answer one of the, 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 the earlier Jonathan questions on, on you know, who, who actually calls the shot. And about the Joseph uh, has a Canadian Hong Kong passport. That's actually quite common because a lot of, uh, you know, the, the Chinese went abroad after Cultural Revolution. You know, my, my dad, my own dad, my uh, was one of, among the first generation that uh, went to study. Uh, he went to study in U.S. in 1985. You know, that's how I came to United States. At that time, Deng Xiaoping uh, said something. He said most of the most of these Chinese students will, will not come back. But even if 20% of them do, that is a boom for China. We, we still gain from that. Um, so Deng Xiaoping proved to be right in the long term because I, I seen that my, um, a lot of my dad's colleagues and, 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 and classmates, they would work in, you know, they graduated in the US. A lot of them have US citizenship. They went on to work in the US corporate world. But after about a decade, um, in, like, I'm talking about in the 2000s, many of them, uh, especially the more ambitious uh, bunch, they found they had, they start to hit a glass ceiling. You know, <laughs> one of the feature of the Chi uh, U.S. tech world is employs a lot of Chinese talent, but not many Chinese talent break into the management tier. So at that point, a lot of my um, my dad's classmates, they start to explore opportunities back home. Many of them went back to China where they could be founders of companies, where they could be VPs, you know, being a position much higher than they would have gotten rising in the U.S. corporate world. And I, I, my guess is Joe, Joseph is one of those returning um, returning Chinese diasporas. And these people, they bring back their own unique experience uh, and expertise they gained working, studying in the West. And, and that helped China to upgrade its own scale uh, skills. I mean, a lot of people in the West talk about China, China stealing technology. Actually, the most important transfer of technology happened with these um, Chinese exchange students who came to study in the West, in the Western universities, who even work in the West. And then when they go back to China, they bring their expertise along with them. And, and you know, again, you, you, right now, U.S. Uh, policy is trying to choke, choke that off. You, you know, under Trump administration, there was a China initiative by the FBI to basically investigate all ethnic Chinese people, researchers, scientists in U.S. for their connection to China. And that has driven, uh, and the China initiative is all officially over under Biden, but the FBI continue its wish hunt. A lot of the Chinese scientists and researchers are returning to China right now. Many of them who um, I think the most ambitious one have already returned back in 2000, uh, 2010s. Uh, but many of them also chose to stay in the West because they're comfortable here. They already have family here. They already have a network here. But now they're being forced to go back to, to China. And I think that's one of the biggest cell phone by US because even in 1990, I remember I go to my dad's lab in University of Illinois and I see all Chinese people working there. <laughs> my, a lot of my, China, my my dad's colleagues, all these Chinese uh, grad students working in the lab. So, uh, you know, the, the, the American research institutions rely um, a lot on you know overseas talent you know and and they're they're now driving that away it's very short-sighted and it, it's gonna bite us in the in the back in the long term yeah it's definitely a, a sign of of the loss of values when you realize that what what people when when a system ends up valuing present power politics and arrangements more than the real source of value which is the mind of people that is what generates new discoveries you you've got right there uh, the, all the recipes for a collapse function underway 
Um, so hopefully they can they can pull their heads out of their asses and let me let me yeah. just uh, I just had a, I had a I thought bubble. So uh, yeah. continue a, a earlier train of thought about you know billionaires in China versus United States. I recently interviewed an excellent uh, U.S. Uh, sci social scientist Peter Turchin. Um, he wrote came out with a book, The End Times, and he studies basically the rise and fall of societies. And he applies a his own scientific model on uh, why societies rise and collapse. And he actually, I think his book offered the best explanation of what happened in Ukraine leading to the Euromaidan, so-called Euromaidan uh, revolution. And he, uh, but he also, one of, the, one of the key points that he derived is that society gets to trouble when there's, you lead over production and popular immiseration, both of which are happening in the United States right now. And what he's talking about, the elite production, when there's too many, too many elites, too many people in the top, they start to jostle for power. And, and this happened um, back in the days be just before U.S. Civil War and also before um uh, before the uh, progressive era, when when you know U.S. had its gilded age, when the wealth pump takes away from the poor and the working class and give it to the rich, when the, when the when the when the when U.S. society was getting a little top heavy, when the you know top one percent not only control most of the so uh, resources of the society, but the top one percent is actually getting bigger. And 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 when all these uh, elites start to infight among themselves, plus the popular discontent resulting from the increasing equality, that led to what he called a, a revolutionary phase in the society. And and China actually by cranking cracking down the, the anti-corruption drive, cracking down on the billionaire, China is actually trying to shut down with that wealth pump and, 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 and reversing the, the process. You know, in the in the a lot of Western media, this is po this is posed as a, what a terrible thing that China is doing to these billionaires, these poor billionaires, right? But <laughs> you know, what actually China is trying to address is the increasing inequalities, make sure it doesn't get out of hand. Um, and, 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 you know, Xi Jinping is often being blamed for, you know, trying to do, you know, wealth di redistribution and, and stuff like that. I mean, <laughs> I mean he, he's just trying to make sure everybody get a piece of the pie. And, and, and according to Peter Turchin, you know, that's how you actually stop societal collapse. You know, that, that's, that's how the U.S. progressive era reversed the gilded age when when there was a time when there was a, a progressive tax on the super rich and that that re funneled some of the the the, the booty of uh, US industrialization to the middle class let, let, well at least to the white US middle class in the 1950s and 60s and and but that process has been reversed since 1970s because the offsource and 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 the globalization and now you he according to his model 2020s is going to be very turbulent uh political political wise and i think we're seeing that right now that's just sorry back to no, you no, don't that that's very good and i mean i think a lot of people they, they a lot of people have picked up on the fact that there is sort of an agenda to eliminate the the idea of the sovereign nation state as an institution that organizes policy both domestic and foreign but they forget that the the well they forget to ask the question well why because it's because the sovereign nation state has the power to rein in this private um, capital, which can become this parasitical agency that has more power than God. And only private, yes. only the nation state has the ability to really wield the influence and power to do something about that fact. And if everybody just goes into this, I'm going to just, you know, get off the grid, decentralize and uh, look out for my personal freedoms, like a lot of the, the libertarian crowd has drank drank this Kool Aid lately. Um, you're gonna just set yourself up for, on the one hand, losing this tool we have right available to us to actually do battle with this this you know private class of of parasites, and we're gonna set ourselves up for just being better divided to be conquered. 
Because if you go Amish, it's not like- exactly exactly because yeah. America, especially, still have live with this frontier mentality, right? Like I mean, I'm just gonna have my own homestead and everybody get off my lawn. But uh, and, and there's this fantasy uh, in, in some kind of post-apocalyptic world, you would just hold up in your own own house or compound with stockpile of weapon and food and you will survive. No, that's not how you survive. That's how you die. Because you the way you survive is build communities with a group of people. Because if you are alone in your house, you, you have to sleep sometimes. And if people know that you have stockpiles of weapons and food, guess what? You are a target. <laughs> the, all they have to do is wait until you are asleep and sneak into your house and you're done for. So what you need is a community of like, like-minded people people you need to build coalitions you need to have a, a community around you that's you know so my uh you know, one of the podcasts i go on to you know radio warner uh podcast like the warner used to say you know he he believes all these uh all these fundamentalist church groups will survive better because they have actually have group solidarity they have community you know this is how you're going to survive in this kind of world and and uh and also of course the, the elite in U.S. because the elite, financial elite already captured the state. You know, they they want the whole world to be their playground. That's why they're trying to destroy sovereignty everywhere and, mm-hmm. and ex- extend the, uh, the, the, the reach of the global empire. Yeah. Back to you, Matt. Do you have time for uh, one more, two more questions? One from Steve, one from uh, Bruce. Yeah, two more questions and I really have to go. And that was it. All right. Prepare. So, yeah. so if you keep, keep them short. Uh, Steve, go for it. Uh, I'll be quick. Carl, what's the Chinese view on the human trafficking scourge versus the drug thing? And I'm just, you know, with the Sound of Freedom movie coming out and all the great work that that's doing and raising awareness, how does China view this? Is it kind of like the, they view the same higher level networks as the drug world or is it something different? Um, uh, can you give me a little bit more specific, um, like what, what, what you're referring to? Well, uh, uh, awareness is human trafficking network. Yeah, like the awareness is starting to raise in the West. And, you know, some of us suspect that it's as pervasive as the drug trafficking, perhaps, you know, it's global. And we're wondering if the same criminal networks or, you know, the same intelligence dimension, you know, is is the Jeffrey Epstein thing, the norm and not the exception. But how does China view that topic? Uh, Do they have any thoughts, opinions? Do they see it a certain way? Well, um, yeah, I mean, and, uh, human trafficking and drug trafficking usually go hand in hand because, you know, a lot of these are done by the same network of underground gangs and uh, uh, <laughs> mafioso. And, and, and they, it's, because these, these are the things that it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a so-called gray economy, right? And, <clears throat> and uh, uh, well, human trafficking is, has been a problem. In China, you know, you know, even back in 1980s, when I was growing up in China, you know, the uh, two women and children are most at risk. You know, like they, you know, when I was young, I would always warn about watch out for like kidnappers of children. Uh, but but this is something that Chinese government is trying to help crack down on, and and they they have been, uh, you know, there have been very uh, a couple of celebrity cases in China about the victim of human trafficking, especially women. Um, and, and, and so, so this is something that's uh, societal wise in China, especially this is something they look um, uh, like people, this is close to people's hearts. So, so this is something that Chinese government is actually actively cracking down on. I, I don't know if uh, they're participating in um, any kind of international cooperation on this crackdown, but within Chinese borders, definitely, it's a, it's it's a, it's a really it's a, it's a, it's an issue that they're they're concentrating on. Thank you. All right, let's round it out with uh, Bruce. Go for it, Bruce. Where can people fo- follow find all your work, Carl? That's a good okay, last. I'm question. a prolific shit. <laughs> I'm a prolific shit shit poster on Twitter, so people can always go to Carl Za. That's my Twitter handle, and uh, I also have uh, a Patreon site, uh, Silk and Steel Podcast, where I <clears throat> concentrate. I do like long talks like this one to talk about China, everything China, history, politics, and culture. Um, uh, you know, I have a long running China history chronologically series. I talk about China history all the way from beginning 
now I think I'm at uh, 550 BC. <laughs> Still a long way to go, but I already covered a couple thousand years. And 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 you know, and uh, I also have a YouTube channel. You can just search Carl Za on my YouTube channel. I uploaded a lot of footage of my recent travel to Moscow, to Russia. I, I like to say seeing is believing. I mean, just just seeing Russia in in multicolors, I think is that's enough to dispel a lot of the common misconceptions. And and a, a lot of my free content are posted on YouTube. Um, a lot of the po po uh, podcast platform as well, I think. But uh, but welcome to check out my uh, my Patreon page because that's how I pay my bills on Bali. You know, I support my family, so <laughs> feel free to subscribe to be my patron on Patreon for the Silk and Steel podcast. Thank you, guys. That's Thank great. You. Yeah, and we're going to make sure that both of those links are going to be available in the description box of this video when it's uploaded onto YouTube. So everybody should check that out if you're listening in the future, um, which is your present when you're listening to me saying this right now, which is weird. Uh, go to the description box and then sign up to Patreon to listen to Carl Jaw's uh, content. Uh, Carl, that was amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time this morning, this evening, this afternoon. And uh, next, this coming Wednesday, just so people know, we have a incredible presentation that is going to be unveiled um, on uh, on Mal. Well, we're just going to go there. We're going to actually shed light on some of the dynamics before, during, and after Mao in a way that most Westerners are not provided. Uh, so that's going to be a special thing. 8 p.m. Eastern Eastern Time Wednesday, and uh, and we got more more to come after that. So Carl, once again, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for taking your Sunday night or Monday morning with us. Thank you. And thanks everyone who is sending your lovely comments. So thank you for your feedback. And I, I love everyone here. Uh, people ask very intelligent questions. Uh, thank you so much. But I got it wrong because I got another podcast on Chinese history coming up. So um, until next time, Matt. I do. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thanks, girl. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.